because I made a mistake and I'm going to just kind of rewind the recording and then get back on it right away. So yeah, without further ado, here we go. Oh, so let me just mention that this is for, uh, I'm recording this, well, for folks so they can have access to this theory, which is Critical Theory by Angela Davis. Um, this is from her 1984 book, Women, Race, and Class, which is some uh, bomb-ass intersectional analysis on class and race and women, obviously, um, as, the, as the name says. Um, and so we're going to be doing a study group on this at the Social Justice Center in Madison, Wisconsin. So I'm recording it for that as well. This, this audio book isn't available anywhere. Uh, Angela Davis only has one audio book of her, her uh, what's called Revolution is a Constant Struggle, I believe it is, that came out in Haymarket Books a few years ago. Um, so yeah, I've also done, so you can check this out on my YouTube channel, and you can also check this out on my RSS podcast feed. I have the other nine chapters already recorded. I've also done Angela Davis's Are Prisons Obsolete, which is another pivotal piece of critical theory that Angela Davis wrote that everyone should know about, honestly. Oh, and shout out to Legal Forms. I don't know if that's the website, but I'm getting this PDF off of legalforms.files.wordpress.com, and they have the, a PDF of this for free up there. And uh, so, yeah. Shout out to them for this. So without further ado, I'm going to begin the recording. Women, Race, and Class by Angela Y. Davis. Chapter 10, Communist Women. In 1848, the year Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published their Communist Manifesto, Europe was the scene of countless revolutionary uprisings. One of the participants in the revolution of 1848, an artillery officer and close co-worker of Marx and Engels named Joseph Weidemeyer, immigrated to the United States and founded the first Marxist organization in the country's history. When Weidemeyer established the Proletarian League in 1852, no women appear to have been associated with the group. If indeed there were any women involved, they have long since faded into historical anonymity. Over the next few decades, women continued to be active in their own labor associations, in the anti-slavery movement, and in the developing campaign for their own rights. But to all intents and purposes, they appear to have been absent from the ranks of the Marxist socialist movement. Like the Proletarian League, the Working Men's National Association and the Communist Club were utterly dominated by men. Even the Socialist Labor Party was also predominantly male. By the time the Socialist Party was founded in 1900, composition of the socialist movement had begun to change. As the general demand for women's equality grew stronger, women were increasingly attracted to the struggle for social change. They began to assert their right to participate in this new challenge to the oppressive structures of their society. From 1900 on, to a greater or lesser extent, the Marxist left would feel the influence of its female adherents. As the main champion of Marxism for almost two decades, the Socialist Party supported the battle for women's equality. For many years, in fact, it was the only political party to advocate women's suffrage. Thanks to such socialist women as Pauline Newman and Rose Schneiderman, a working-class suffrage movement was forged breaking the decade-long stronghold of middle-class women on the mass campaign for the vote. By 1908, the Socialist Party had created a National Women's Commission. On March 8 of that year, women socialists active on New York's Lower East Side organized a mass demonstration in support of equal suffrage whose anniversary continues to be observed all over the world as International Women's Day. When the Communist Party was founded in 1919, actually two communist parties, which later united, were established, 
Former Socialist Party women were among its earliest leaders and activists. Mother Ella Reeve Bloor, Anita Whitney, Margaret Previ, Kate Sadler Greenhow, Rose Pastor Stokes, and Jeanette Pearl were all communists who had been associated with the left wing of the Socialist Party. Although the International Workers of the World was not a political party, and in fact opposed the organization of political parties, it was the second major influence on the formation of the Communist Party. The IWW, popularly known as the Wobblies, was founded in June 1905. Defining itself as an industrial union, the IWW proclaimed that there could never be a harmonious relationship between the capitalist class and the workers it employed. The Wobblies' ultimate goal was socialism, and their strategy was unrelenting class struggle. When Big Bill Haywood convened the first meeting, two of the leading labor organizers who sat on the platform were women, Mother Mary Jones and Lucy Parsons. While both the Socialist Party and the IWW admitted women to their ranks and encouraged them to become leaders and agitators, only the IWW embraced a complementary policy of forthright struggle against racism. Under the leadership of Daniel de Leon, the Socialist Party did not acknowledge the unique oppression of black people. Although the majority of black people were agricultural workers, sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and farm laborers, the socialists argued that the only proletarians were relevant to their movement. Even the outstanding leader, Eugene Debs, argued that black people required no overall defense of their rights to be equal and free as a group. Since the socialists' overriding concern was the struggle between capital and labor, so Debs maintained, we have nothing special to offer the Negro. As for the international workers of the world, their main goal was to organize the wage-earning class and to develop revolutionary socialist class consciousness. Unlike the Socialist Party, however, the IWW focused explicit attention on the special problems of black people. According to Mary White Ovington, there are two organizations in this country that have shown they do care about full rights for the Negro. The first is the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. The second organization that attacks Negro segregation is the industrial workers of the world. The IWW has stood with the Negro. Helen Holman was a black socialist, a leading spokesperson in the campaign to defend her imprisoned party leader, Kate Richards O'Hare. As a black woman, however, the socialist party. Prior to World War II, the numbers of working in industry were negligible. As a consequence, they were all but ignored by Socialist Party recruiters. The Socialists' posture of negligence vis-a-vis -vis black women was one of the unfortunate legacies the Communist Party would have to overcome. According to the Communist leader and historian William Z. Foster, during the early 1920s, the party was neglectful of the particular demands of Negro women in industry. Over the next decade, however, communists came to recognize the centrality of racism in U.S. society. They developed a series theory. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a mistake. Be right with me. They developed a serious theory of black liberation and forged a consistent activist record in the overall struggle against racism. Lucy Parsons. Lucy Parsons remains one of these few black women whose name has occasionally appeared in the chronicles of the U.S. labor movement. Almost universally, however, she is simplistically identified as the devoted wife of the Haymarket martyr Albert Parsons. 
To be sure, Lucy Parsons was one of her husband's most militant defenders, but she was far more than a faithful wife and angry widow who wanted to defend and avenge her husband. As Carolyn Asbov's recent biography confirms, her journalistic and agitational defense of the working class as a whole spanned a period of more than 60 years. Lucy Parsons' involvement in labor struggles began almost a decade before the Haymarket Massacre and continued for another 55 years afterward. Her political development ranged from her youthful advocacy of anarchism to her membership in the Communist Party during her mature years. Born in 1853, Lucy Parsons became active in the Socialist Labor Party as early as 1877. Over the years to come, this anarchist organization's newspaper, The Socialist, would publish her articles and poems and Parsons would also become an active organizer for the Chicago Working Women's Union. Following the police-instigated riot on May 1, 1886, in Chicago's Haymarket Square, her husband was one of the eight radical labor leaders arrested by the authorities. Lucy Parsons immediately initiated a militant campaign to free the Haymarket defendants. As she traveled throughout the country, she became known as a prominent labor leader and a leading advocate of anarchism. Her reputation caused her to become an all-too-frequent target of repression. In Columbus, Ohio, for example, the mayor banned a speech she was scheduled to deliver during the month of March, and her refusal to respect this banning order led the police to throw her in jail. In city after city, halls were closed to her at the last moment. Detectives stood in every corner of the meeting halls. Police kept her under constant surveillance. Even as her husband was being executed, Lucy Parsons and her two children were arrested by Chicago police, one of whom made the comment that women is more to be feared than a thousand rioters. Although she was black, a fact miscegenation laws often caused her to conceal, and although she was a woman, Lucy Parsons argued that racism and sexism were overshadowed by the capitalists' overall exploitation of the working class. Since they were victims of capitalist exploitation, said Parsons, black people and women, no less than white people and men, should devote all their energies to the class struggle. In her eyes, black people and women did not suffer special forms of oppression, and there was no real need for mass movements to oppose racism and sexism explicitly. Sex and race, according to Lucy Parsons' theory, were facts of existence manipulated by employers who sought to justify their greater exploitation of women and people of color. If black people suffered the brutality of lynch law, it was because their poverty as a group made them the most vulnerable workers of all. Are there any so stupid, Parsons asked in 1886, as to believe these outrages have been heaped upon the Negro because he is black? Not at all. It is because he is poor. It is because he is dependent because he is poorer as a class than his white wage slave brother of the North. Lucy Parsons and Mother Mary Jones were the first two women to join the radical labor organization known as the International Workers of the World. Highly respected in the labor movement, both were invited to sit in the Presidium alongside Eugene Debs and Big Bill Haywood during the 1905 founding convention of the IWW. In the speech Lucy Parsons delivered to the convention delegates, she revealed her special sensitivity to the oppression of working women who, in her view, were manipulated by the capitalists as they sought to reduce the wages of the entire working class. We, the women of this country, have no ballot even if we wish to use it, but we have our labor. 
Wherever wages are to be reduced, the capitalist class uses women to reduce them. Moreover, during this era, when the plight of prostitutes was virtually ignored, Parsons told the IWW convention that she also spoke for my sisters whom I can see in the night when I go out in Chicago. During the 1920s, Lucy Parsons began to associate herself with the struggles of the Young Communist Party. One of the many people who was deeply impressed by the 1917 workers' revolution in Russia, she became confident that eventually the working class could triumph in the United States of America. When communists and other progressive forces founded the International Labor Defense in 1925, Parsons became an active worker for the new group. She fought for the freedom of Tom Mooney in California for the Scottsboro Nine in Alabama, and for the young black communist Angelo Herndon, whom Georgia authorities had imprisoned. It was 1939, according to her biographer's research, that Lucy Parsons formally joined the Communist Party. When she died in 1942, a tribute in the Daily Worker described her as a link between the labor movement of the present and the great historic events of the 1880s. She was one of America's truly great women, fearless and devoted to the working class. Ella Reeve Bloor Born in 1862, the remarkable labor organizer and agitator for women's rights, black equality, peace, and socialism, who was popularly the little bit of a book. Who was popularly known as Mother Bloor, became of the Socialist Party soon after it was founded. She went on to become a socialist leader and a living legend for the working class across the country. Hitchhiking from one end of the United States to the other, she became the heart and soul of untold numbers of strikes. Streetcar operators in Philadelphia heard her first strike speeches. In other parts of the country, miners, textile workers, and sharecroppers were among the workers who benefited from her astounding oratorical talents and her powerful skills as an organizer. At the age of 62, Mother Bloor was still thumbing rides from one state to another. When she was 78, Mother Bloor published the story of her life as a labor organizer from her pre-socialist days through the period of her Communist Party membership. As a socialist, her working class consciousness did not include an explicit awareness of black people's special oppression. As a communist, however, Mother Bloor fought numerous manifestations of racism and urged others to follow her example. In 1929, for example, when the International Labor Defense held its convention in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we had engaged rooms for all the delegates at the Monongahela Hotel. When we arrived late at night with 25 Negro delegates, the manager of the hotel said that while they could stay there that night, they must all get out immediately the next morning. Next morning, we voted that the whole convention should adjourn to the hotel in an orderly fashion. We marched to the hotel, carrying banners emphasizing no discrimination. We filed into the lobby, which by that time was filled with newspaper men, policemen, and curious crowds. During the early 1930s, Mother Bloor addressed a meeting in Lope City, Nebraska, in support of women who had struck against their poultry farm employers. The strike assembly was violently assaulted by a racist mob opposed to the presence of black people at the meeting. When the police arrived, Mother Bloor was arrested together with a black woman and her husband. The black woman Mrs. Floyd Booth was a leading member of the local anti-war committee, and her husband was an activist in the town's unemployed council. 
when the local farmers raised sufficient bail money to obtain Mother Bloor's release, she refused their aid, insisting that she would not leave until the booths could accompany her. I felt I could not accept the bail and leave the two Negro comrades in jail, in an atmosphere so dangerously charged with bitter hate of Negroes. During this period, Mother Bloor organized a U.S. delegation to attend an international women's conference in Paris. Four of the women included in the delegation were black. Capitola Tasker, Alabama sharecropper, tall and graceful, the life of the whole delegation. Lulia Jackson, elected by the Pennsylvania miners, a woman who represented the mothers of the Scottsboro boys in Mabel Byrd, a brilliant young honor graduate of the University of Washington, who had had a position with the International Labor Office in Geneva. At the 1934 Paris Conference, Capitola Tasker was one of the three U.S. women elected to serve as a member of the Assembly's Executive Committee, along with Mother Bloor and the woman representing the Socialist Party. Mabel Byrd, the black college graduate, was elected as one of the conference's secretaries. Lulia Jackson, the black representative of Pennsylvania miners, emerged as one of the Paris Women's Conference leading personalities. In her persuasive response to the pacifist faction attending the gathering, she argued that support for the war against fascism was the sole means of guaranteeing a meaningful peace. During the course of the women's deliberations, a committed pacifist had complained, I think there is too much about fighting in that anti-war manifesto. It says fight against war, fight for peace, fight, fight, fight. We are women, we are mothers, we don't want to fight. We know that even when our children are bad, we are nice to them, and we win them by love, not by fighting them. Lulia Jackson's counter-argument was forthright and lucid. Ladies, it has just been said that we must not fight, that we must be gentle and kind to our enemies, to those who are for war. I can't agree with that. Everyone knows the cause of war. It is capitalism. We can't just give those bad capitalists their supper and put them to bed the way we do with our children. We must fight them. As Mother Bloor relates in her autobiography, everyone laughed and applauded, even the pacifist. And the anti-war manifesto was consequently approved by the entire body. When the conference was addressed by Capitola Tasker, the black sharecropper from Alabama, they heard her compare the current European fascism with the racist terror suffered by black people in the United States. Having vividly described the Southern and mob murders, she acquainted the Paris delegates with the violent repression aimed at sharecroppers who were attempting to organize in Alabama. Her own opposition to fascism ran deep, so Capitola Tasker explained, for she herself was already been victimized by its terrible ravages. She concluded her speech with the sharecropper song, which she adapted to fit the occasion. Like a tree that's standing by the water, we shall not be moved. We're against war and fascism. We shall not be moved. As the U.S. delegation returned home by boat, Mother Bloor recorded Capitola Tasker's moving testimony about her Paris experiences. Mother, when I get back to Alabama and go out to that cotton patch back of our little old shack, I'll stand there thinking to myself, Capitola, did you really go over there to Paris and see all those wonderful women and hear all those great talks, or was it just a dream that you were over there? And if it turns out that it really wasn't a dream, why, mother, I'm just going to broadcast all over Alabama all that I've learned over there and tell them how women from all over the world are fighting to stop the kind of terror we have in the South and to stop war. 
as Mother Bloor and her Communist Party comrades concluded, the working class cannot assume its historical role as a revolutionary force if workers do not struggle relentlessly against the social poison of racism. The long list of stunning accomplishments associated with the name of Ella Reeve Bloor reveals that this white communist woman was a deeply principled ally of the black liberation movement. Anita Whitney. When Anita Whitney was born in 1867 to a wealthy San Francisco family, no one would have suspected that she would eventually be the chairperson of the California Communist Party. Perhaps she was destined to become a political activist, for as a fresh graduate of Wellesley, the prestigious New England Women's College, she did volunteer charity and settlement housework and soon became an active champion of women's suffrage. Upon her return to California, Anita Whitney joined the Equal Suffrage League and was elected president in time to see her state become the sixth in the nation to extend the vote to women. In 1914, Anita Whitney joined the Socialist Party. Despite her party's posture of relative indifference toward black people's struggles, she readily supported anti-racist causes. When the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the National Association for the advancement of colored people was founded, Whitney enthusiastically agreed to serve as a member of its executive committee. Having identified with the positions of left-wing members of the Socialist Party, she joined those who established the Communist Labor Party in 1919. Shortly thereafter, this group merged with the Communist Party USA. 1919 was the year of the infamous anti-communist raids initiated by Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Anita was destined to become one of the many victims of the Palmer raids. She was informed that a speech she was scheduled to deliver before club women associated with the Oakland Center of the Cal League had been banned by the authorities. But despite the official prohibition, she spoke on November 28, 1919, about the Negro problem in the United States. Her remarks were sharply focused on the issue of lynching. Since 1890, when our statistics have their beginning, there have occurred in these United States 3,228 lynchings, 2,500 of colored men, and 50 of colored women. I would that I could leave the subject with these bare facts recording numbers, but I feel that we must face all the barbarity of the situation in order to do our part in blotting this disgrace from our country's record. She went on to pose a question to the audience of white club women. Did they know that a colored man once said that if he owned hell and Texas, he would prefer to rent out Texas and live in hell? His reasoning, she explained in a serious vein, was based on the fact that Texas could claim the third largest number of racist mob murders committed throughout the southern states. Only Georgia and Mississippi could boast of more. In 1919, it was still something of a rarity for a white person to appeal to others of her race to stand up against the scourge of lynching. The generalized racist propaganda and the repeated evocation of the mythical black rapist in particular had resulted in the desired division and alienation. Even in progressive circles, white people were often hesitant to speak out against lynchings since they were justified as unfortunate reactions to black sexual attacks against white womenhood in the South. Anita Whitney was one of those white people whose vision remained clear despite the power of the prevailing racist propaganda, and she was willing to risk the consequences of her anti-racist stance. Although it was clear that she would be arrested, she chose to speak about lynching to the white Oakland clubwomen. Sure enough, she was taken into custody at the conclusion of her speech and charged by the authorities with criminal syndicalism. Whitney was later convicted and sentenced to San Quentin Prison, 
where she spent several weeks before her release on appeal bond. It was not until 1927 that Anita Whitney was pardoned by the governor of California. As a 20th century white woman, Anita Whitney was indeed a pioneer in the struggle against racism. Together with her black comrades, she and others like her urged the Communist Party's strategy for working class emancipation. In this strategy, the fight for black liberation would be a central ingredient. In 1936, Anita Whitney became the state chairperson of the Communist Party of California and was elected soon thereafter to serve on the party's national committee. Once she was asked, Anita, how do you regard the Communist Party? What has it come to mean to you? Why, she said, smiling incredulously, a bit taken aback by such an amazing question, why, it has given purpose to my life. The Communist Party is the hope of the world. Just going to pause for a drink. Do -do -do -do. And continuing. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. When Elizabeth Gurley Flynn died in 1964, at the age of 74, she had been active in socialist and communist causes for almost 60 years. Raised by parents who were members of the Socialist Party, she discovered at an early age her own affinity with the socialist challenge to the capitalist class. Oopsie. Raised by parents who were members of the Socialist Party, she discovered at an early age her own affinity with the Socialists' challenge to the capitalist class. The young Elizabeth was not yet 16 when she delivered her first public lecture in defense of socialism. Based on her readings of Marilee Wallstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women and August Bebel's Women and Socialism, she delivered a speech in 1906 at the Harlem Socialist Club entitled, What Socialism Will Do for Women. Although her somewhat male supremacist father had been reluctant to allow Elizabeth to speak in public, the enthusiastic reception in Harlem caused him to change his mind. Accompanying her father, she became familiar with street speaking, which was a typical radical tactic of the period. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn experienced her first arrest soon thereafter, charged with speaking without a permit. She was carted off to jail with her father. By the time Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was 16, her career as an agitator for the rights of the working class had been launched. Her first task was the defense of Big Bill Haywood, whose frame-up on criminal charges had been instigated by the Copper Trusts. During her westward travels on behalf of Haywood, she joined the IWW's struggle in Montana and Washington. After two years as a Socialist Party member, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn became a leading IWW organizer. She resigned from the Socialist Party, convinced that it was sterile and sectarian compared with this grassroots movement that was sweeping the country. With an abundance of strike experiences behind her, including numerous clashes with the police, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn headed for Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912 when the textile workers went out on strike. The grievances of the Lawrence workers were simple and compelling. In the words of Mary Heaton Vorse, wages in Lawrence were so low that 35% of the people made under $7 a week. Less than a fifth got more than $12 a week. They were divided by nationality. They spoke over 40 languages and dialects, but they were united by meager living and the fact that their children died. For every five children under one year of age, one died. Only a few other towns in America had higher death rates. These were all mill towns. Of all the speakers addressing the strike meeting, said Vorse, who was covering these events for Harper's Weekly, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was the workers' most powerful inspiration. It was her words which encouraged them to persevere. 
When Elizabeth Gurley Flynn spoke, the excitement of the crowd became a visible thing. She stood there, young, with her Irish blue eyes, her face magnolia white, and her cloud of black hair, the picture of a youthful revolutionary girl leader. She stirred them, lifted them up in her appeal for solidarity. It was as though a spurt of flame had gone through this audience, something stirring and powerful, a feeling which had made the liberation of people possible. As a traveling strike agitator for the IWW, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn sometimes worked alongside the well-known Native American Indian leader, Frank Little. In 1916, for example, they both represented the Wobblies during the Masabi Iron Range strike in Minnesota. It was barely a year later when Elizabeth learned that Frank Little had been lynched in Butte, Montana. He had been attacked by a mob after making agitational speeches to the miners on strike in the area. Six masked men came to the hotel at night, broke down the door, dragged Frank from his bed, took him to a railroad trestle on the outskirts of town, and there hanged him. A month following Frank Little's death, a federal indictment charged that 168 people had conspired with him to hinder the execution of certain laws of the United States. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was the only woman then among, among the accused of Ben. Do, 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 do. Among the accused in Ben Fletcher, a Philadelphia longshoreman and leader of the IWW, was the only black person named in the indictment. Judging from Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's autobiographical reflections, she was aware from the very beginning of her political career of the special oppression suffered by black people. Her consciousness of the importance of anti-racist struggles was doubtlessly intensified by her involvement in the IWW. The Wobblies publicly proclaimed that there is only one labor organization in the United States that admits the colored worker on a footing of absolute equality with the white, the industrial workers of the world. Okay, I had a little error there. Press the wrong button. Was the only woman among the accused in Ben Fletcher, a Philadelphia longshoreman and leader of the IWW, was the only black person named in the indictment. Judging from Elizabeth Gurley. Flynn's autobiographical reflections, she was aware from the very beginning of her political career of the special oppression suffered by black people. Her consciousness of the importance of anti-racist struggles was doubtlessly intensified by her involvement in the IWW. The Wobblies publicly proclaimed that there is only one labor organization in the United States that admits the colored worker on a footing of absolute equality with the white the industrial workers of the world. In the IWW, the colored worker, man or woman, is on an equal footing with every other worker. But the IWW was a syndicalist organization concentrating on industrial workers who, thanks to racist discrimination, were still overwhelmingly white. The tiny minority of black industrial workers included practically no women who remained absolutely banned from industrial occupations. Indeed, most black workers, male and female alike, still worked in agriculture or domestic service. As a result, only a fraction of the black population could be reached through an industrial union, unless the union strenuously fought for black people's admission into industry. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn became active in the Communist Party in 1937 and emerged soon afterward as one of the organization's major leaders, working on an intimate basis with such black communists as Benjamin Davis and Claudia Jones 
she developed a new understanding of the central role of black liberation within the overall battle for the emancipation of the working class. In 1948, Flynn published an article in Political Affairs, the party's theoretical journal, on the meaning of International Women's Day. As she argued in this article, the right to work, to training, upgrading, and equal seniority, safeguards for health and safety, adequate child care facilities, these remain the urgent demands of organized working women and are needed by all who toil, especially Negro women. Criticizing the inequality between women war veterans and men war veterans, she reminded her readers that black women veterans suffered to an even greater degree than their white sisters. Indeed, black women were generally caught in a threefold bond of oppression. Every inequality and disability inflicted on American white women is aggravated a thousandfold among Negro women who are triply exploited as Negroes, as workers, and as women. This same triple jeopardy analysis, incidentally, was later proposed by black women who sought to influence the early stages of the contemporary women's liberation movement. While Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's first autobiography, I Speak My Own Peace or The Rebel Girl, provides fascinating glimpses into her experiences as an IWW agitator, her second book, The Alderson Story, or My Life as a Political Prisoner, reveals a new political maturity and a more profound consciousness of racism. During the McCarthy era assault on the Communist Party, Flynn was arrested in New York, along with three other women, and charged with teaching and advocating the violent overthrow of the government. The other women were Marion Bachrock, Betty Gannett, and Claudia Jones, a black woman from Trinidad who had immigrated to the United States as a young girl. In June 1951, the four communist women were taken by the police to the New York Women's House of Detention. The one pleasant episode which lighted up our stay here involved the birthday party which Elizabeth, Betty, and Claudia organized for one of the prisoners. Discouraged and lonely, a 19-year-old black woman had happened to mention that the next day would be her birthday. The three women managed to obtain a cake from the commissary. We made candles of tissue paper for the cake covered the table as nicely as possible with paper napkins and saying happy birthday. We made speeches to her and she cried with surprise and happiness. The next day we received a note from her as follows. Dear Claudia, Betty and Elizabeth, I am very glad for what you did for me for my birthday. I really don't know how to thank you. Yesterday was one of the best years of my life. I think even though you all are communist people, that you are the best people I have ever met. The reason I put communists in this letter is because some people don't like communists for the simple reason they think communist people is against the American people, but I don't think so. I think that you are some of the nicest people I ever met in my whole 19 years of living, and I will never forget you all no matter where I be. I hope you all will get out of this trouble and never have to come back to a place like this. After the three women's Smith Act trial, Marion Bachrock's health problems led to the severance of her case. They were convicted and sentenced to serve time in the Federal Reformatory for Women in Alderson, Virginia. Shortly before they arrived, the prison had been placed under court order to desegregate its facilities. Another Smith Act victim, Dorothy Rose Blumenberg from Baltimore, had already served a portion of her three-year sentence as one of the first white prisoners to be housed with black women. We felt both amused and flattered that communists were called upon to help integrate prison houses. 
Yet, as Elizabeth Gurley Flynn pointed out, the legal desegregation of the prison's cottages did not have the result of ending racial discrimination. The black women continued to be assigned to the hardest jobs on the farm, in the cannery, in maintenance, and at the piggery until it was abolished. As a leader of the Communist Party, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn had developed a deep commitment to the black liberation struggle and had come to realize that black people's resistance is not always consciously political. She observed that among the prisoners in Alderson, there was greater solidarity among Negro women, undoubtedly a result of life outside, especially in the South. It seemed to me that they were of better character, by and large, stronger and more dependable, with less inclination to tattle or be a stool pigeon than the white inmates. She made friends more easily among the black women in prison than she did among the white inmates. Frankly, I trusted the Negro women more than I did the whites. They were more controlled, less hysterical, less spoiled, more mature. And the black women, in turn, were more receptive to Elizabeth. Perhaps they sensed in this white women communist an instinctive kinship and struggle. Claudia Jones Born in Trinidad when it was still the British West Indies, Claudia Jones immigrated to the United States with her parents when she was still quite young. She later became one of the countless black people throughout the country who joined the movement to free the Scottsboro Nine. It was through her work in the Scottsboro Defense Committee that she became acquainted with members of the Communist Party, whose organization she enthusiastically joined. As a young woman in her 20s, Claudia Jones assumed responsibility for the party's women's commission and became a leader and symbol of struggle for communist women throughout the country. Among the many articles Claudia Jones published in the journal Political Affairs, one of the most outstanding was the June 1949 piece entitled An End to the Neglect of the Problems of the Negro Woman. Her vision of black women in this essay was meant to refute the usual male supremacist stereotypes regarding the nature of women's role. Black women's leadership, as Jones pointed out, had always been indispensable to their people's fight for freedom. Seldom mentioned in the orthodox histories, for example, was the fact that the sharecropper strikes of the 1930s were sparked by Negro women. Moreover, Negro women played a magnificent part in the pro-CIO days in strikes and other struggles, both as workers and as wives of workers, to win recognition of the principle of industrial unionism in such industries as auto, packing, steel, etc. More recently, the militancy of Negro women unionists is shown in the strike of the packing house workers, and even more so in the tobacco workers' strike, in which such leaders as Miranda Smith and Velma Hopkins emerged as outstanding trade unionists. Claudia Jones chided progressives, and especially trade unionists, for failing to acknowledge black domestic workers' efforts to organize themselves. Because the majority of black women workers were still employed in domestic service, she argued the paternalistic attitudes toward maids influenced the prevailing social definition of black women as a group. The continued relegation of Negro women to domestic work has helped to perpetuate and intensify chauvinism directed against all Negro women. Jones was not afraid to remind her own white friends and comrades that too many progressives and even some communists are still guilty of exploiting Negro domestic workers, and they are sometimes guilty of participating in the vilification of maids when speaking to their bourgeois neighbors in their own families. Claudia Jones was very much a communist, a dedicated communist, who believed that socialism held the only promise of liberation for black women, for black people as a whole, and indeed for the multiracial working class. 
Thus, her criticism was motivated by the constructive desire to urge her white co-workers and comrades to purge themselves of racist and sexist attitudes. As for the party itself, in our clubs we must conduct an intense discussion of the rule of Negro women so as to equip our party membership with a clear understanding for undertaking the necessary struggles in the shops and communities. As many black women had argued before her, Claudia Jones claimed that white women in the progressive movement, and especially white women communists, bore a special responsibility toward black women. The very economic relationship of Negro women to white women which perpetuates madam-made relationships, feeds chauvinist attitudes, and makes it incumbent on white women progressives and especially communists to fight consciously against all manifestations of white chauvinism, open and subtle. When Claudia Jones's Smith Act conviction led to her imprisonment in Alderson Federal Reformatory for Women, she discovered a veritable microcosm of the race society she already knew so well. Although the prison was under court order to desegregate its facilities, Claudia was assigned to a colored cottage, which isolated her from her two white comrades. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Betty Gannett. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn especially suffered from this separation, for she and Claudia Jones were close friends as well as comrades. When Claudia was released from prison in October of 1955, ten months after the communist women had arrived at Alderson, Elizabeth was happy for her friend, yet aware of the pain she would suffer in Claudia's absence. My window faced the roadway, and I was able to see her leave. She turned to wave, tall, slender, beautiful, dressed in golden brown, and then she was gone. This was the hardest day I spent in prison. I felt so alone. On the day Claudia Jones left Alderson, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn wrote a poem entitled Farewell to Claudia. Nearer and nearer drew this day, dear comrade, when I from you must sadly part. Day after day, a dark foreboding sorrow crept through my anxious heart. No more to see you striding down the pathway, no more to see your smiling eyes and radiant face, no more to hear your gay and pealing laughter no more encircled by your love in this sad place. How I will miss you, words will fail to utter. I am alone, my thoughts unshared these weary days. I feel bereft and empty on this gray and dreary morning, facing my lonely future hemmed in by prison ways. Sometimes I feel you've never been in Alderson, so full of life, so detached from here you seem, so proud of walk, of talk, of work, of being. Your presence here is like a fading fe fevered dream. Yet as the sun shines now through fog and darkness, I feel a sudden joy that you are gone, that once again you walk the streets of Harlem, that today for you at least is freedom's dawn. I will be strong in our common faith, dear comrade. I will be self-sufficient to our ideals, firm and true. I will be strong to keep my mind and soul outside a prison, encouraged and inspired by ever-loving memories of you. Soon after Claudia Jones was released from Alderson, the pressures of McCarthyism resulted in her deportation to England. She continued her political work for a while, editing a journal called the West Indian Gazette, but her failing health continued to deteriorate and she soon fell ill with the D. There's like one paragraph left.
but her failing health continued to deteriorate, and she soon fell ill with a disease which claimed her life. Okay, hey, that's it, y'all. That was very, very touching and dramatic end there to that chapter. Yeah, that's it. That's uh, chapter 10 from Women Racing Class by Angela Davis. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to check out my YouTube. Um, I'm going to have it up there. You can listen to it. It's particularly useful on my RSS feed, like podcast feed. I'll be, I'll be putting them up there. That's nice because you can listen to it a lot easier than you can on YouTube. So check that out as well. I got links in the comments. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in and peace out. I'm Lil Guillotine. Cheers. YouTube, Facebook folks. I mean, YouTube folks. Appreciate you tuning in, y'all. Yeah, Lucy Parsons. Hey. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, y'all. Take it easy. Thanks for tuning in. Hassan Khan in the house. Yo. Appreciate you.